to welcome you to our webinar on moving your strategy course online. Many of us are currently challenged to either teach strategy online for the first time or to incorporate more online delivery. So what we intend to do today is to support you in making this transition on, to online a success. I'm very privileged um, to be joined by very experienced strategy educators who have agreed to share their um, wisdom and share their insights. So with us today are Protidi Dastidar, Greg Marr, Polo Prokno, all from the University of Maryland, and Felipe Montero from INSEAD. Thank you for joining us today. So what do we have planned for today's session? In terms of the profile of um, attendees who are here with us today, 85% of you indicated that you have no or very little experience teaching online. And most of you, two thirds, about two thirds of you, have a lot of experience teaching strategy. So with that in mind, we thought it would be most beneficial if our panelists shared some general tips about uh, moving a strategy course online and Paolo will do that. And then we will deep dive a little bit more into specific strategy areas that are probably part of many core strategy courses. So we will include um, the external analysis covered by Protiti, internal analysis, um, and Greg will speak to that. And finally, um, global strategy and Philippe uh, will cover some insights on that. What you will notice as we go through the webinar is that our panelists all have quite different styles and different approaches in terms of using synchronous and asynchronous deliveries uh, in terms of the various tools and techniques that they use. So it will be very interesting just to see um, how this variation uh, can be applied in a strategy course. So I'm sure you all find um, some useful ideas and useful um, tricks for your own uh, strategy course. Now, without any further ado, I would like to hand you over to Paolo to kick off the session. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Let me share my screen. So, um, welcome everybody. And uh, I, I will have a brief introduction here, uh, mostly for people that have no experience teaching online. So if you are very experienced, you probably you went through those questions already. But just some basic introduction that is also not specific to strategy, but there are some elements here that will relate to uh, specifically teaching strategy. So, uh, and a lot of those are questions that I asked myself when I started teaching in the online MBA um, five, six years ago. And then also questions now in my role as assistant dean for the part-time in online MBA that faculty ask me. So I, I think there are some myths there about online teaching that are not necessarily true. So one of them is that you have to develop a, a synchronous materials uh, in your courses. And no, you don't. So that's, uh, you, can teach, you can teach a course completely synchronously. In spring, I did that when we moved everything online. My core strategy course, my global strategy elective, both of them, both of them were fully synchronous online, but it depends. Depends, of course, on how long is your live session. If your live session uh, is, one and a half hours, you can do that synchronously without people feeling fatigue. If it's a three or four hour block, probably you have to make it shorter and create some asynchronous materials. So uh, depends on the audience also. Some audiences may, uh, I mean, master students, they, they will be there for 90 minutes without many issues. Undergraduates, maybe not, you have to break into smaller segments. So. That's one thing that some people sometimes are afraid of having to develop that. That's not necessarily true. Second thing that people think that they have to record themselves teaching lectures. No, you don't. It depends. First, there are off the shelf solutions available. You, you can have Michael Porter talking about five forces. Why would you record yourself talking about five forces? And also articles sometimes. I, uh, I hate to watch people lecturing. I prefer to read an article. I, I don't like to watch even Michael Porter talking about five forces. I prefer to read the article from Michael Porter. So make your decisions in your course based on kind of different needs from the audience. And uh, in my case, for example, I, I prefer to keep the inductive. I mean, usually strategy courses are case-based inductive. So my lecture comes after. So we discuss the case in class and I have a mini lecture during the live session. So that, that's something you have to rethink your course and think what are the elements that 
can be done before, what are the elements that can be done after, but lecture could be something that is part of the live session, for example. So flipped classroom, this, this label flipped classroom, they, it can mean very different things. So Pratiti will explore a little bit more uh, later. So that, there are multiple, you don't need to follow necessarily that recipe that, okay, you will record the theory, the lectures, and then people will do homework in the classroom. That's not necessarily true for uh, every course. Another thing that scares some people is that I need the latest gadgets and additional software to create engagement. No, you don't. Uh, well, it depends. First, a good headset obviously helps. You need a good microphone. Using dual screen, I mean, if you're using Zoom, I'm, I'm basically, I, I connect my computer to a TV and then I can see all the students on the TV, up to 49 students on the TV, and then I do things on my laptop. So th th there are easy solutions uh, uh, to be able to, for example, see all, all the students. And don't get stressed about the 1,000 tips on how to look professional in Zoom. I mean, there, there are a lot of videos now available how you should look. You can look anywhere, any way you want in a sense, if you teach well, people will not. You're not a guru, you're not George Clooney, or so you're just trying to deliver a course. And a lot of students also, they are, they have different things in the background. So I'll, I'll probably, I will end my virtual background. So yes, I have kind of a ugly background or whatever. You don't need. Uh, and then some basic Zoom functions such as yes, no answers can be as effective as additional software. I will talk more about that in the next slide. So, and then there, there is also the thing, I need to create engagement during the live sessions. That one you do. That, that there is no, it depends here. You have to create, but we are strategy faculty. We have to create engagement in our classes, regardless of face-to-face -face online. So you have to create interaction opportunities in your live sessions. Use breakout rooms, that's almost mandatory. Ju jump from room to room, talk to the students in smaller groups, that's important. Some people say predictability is important and you see some examples, uh, if you do every time the same thing in the classroom, it, it's better. But then some students don't like that. I, I had some, uh, after my courses, sometimes students say, oh, we would like more variation from class to class. So try to find that kind of, uh, mid of the road between predictability, having some things that students know what to expect, but also throwing some unpredictable things uh, during the session. And then uh, using the yes, no uh, function on, uh, on Zoom, it, it's a great way to engage the students that don't volunteer to speak. You ask a simple question, you see who answered no, and you ask, oh, person X, why you answered no uh, to this question? So, so you can get more engagement just purely by using uh, software that is on Zoom already. On the student side, uh, asking them to use the side-by-side -side mode when you are sharing your screen, it's better because then they can resize the screen and they can see, they can put on gallery view so they can see multiple people, so they can see each other even during the presentation. So that, that's an important thing to use. So I, I think the basic message here is the most important thing is to be yourself. Don't try to follow standard recipes on how to behave on Zoom, that's not going to work well if it doesn't fit your style. We will see here multiple examples that different people making different choices based on their audience and also based on their own style. So um, we will start with Pratiti. She will talk about teaching external analysis in a context of mostly an undergraduate audience. So she will talk more about that and then Greg will expand more on a a synchronous mode of delivery of internal analysis. So, Pratiti. Thank you, Paolo. Um, so, if you would stop sharing your screen so that I can. Okay. Um, let, let me share my screen for. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone, I'm Pratiti Dasidar, also at the University of Maryland. And as Paolo mentioned, um, 
I'm going to talk about external analysis. That's very usually in most of our strategy courses. That's the first topic that we introduce um, uh, in the strategy course. So first, uh, let me talk a little bit about the background. Um, so I'm going to talk about the context. Who do I teach and how long the class is and all of that. The setup, the content, the delivery, and then the results. Um, so let's get started. So firstly, uh, as Paolo already mentioned, I teach the undergraduate strategy course. Uh, every semester we have about 10 or 12 sections. I teach multiple of those sections. I also teach in the online MBA uh, with lots of projects and I love doing projects and I do do live projects even in the undergraduate strategy course online. Uh, so I can talk a little bit about doing real world projects online as well. Well. Um, I sometimes have uh, business uh, students in this uh, course and I also teach non-business students. So in the non-business students uh, course I get uh, computer science, chemistry, all kinds of students from across campus as well. Um, now the most important thing for the audience as Paolo mentioned we all have different modes of delivery. I do the uh, flipped format and I will uh, talk a little bit more about what the uh, flip format is. For this undergraduate course I moved 100% online in the middle of March and it was really with no trouble at all because I already had the flipped format. The flipped format works really well both for uh, online as well as face-to-face -face. and I will explain a little bit more about uh, why it works so well. Um, and uh, the flipped format, because most of the uh, lecture notes and slides and all of that is available already online, the students can look at it before they come to class. Therefore, when I do class, I do the in-depth analysis of uh, the cases. Um, so that's when, you know, usually in the face-to-face -face session and if you're doing it online, then I do it 100% synchronous, which means that all the students are online with me at the same time and we're going through a full case discussion just like we would uh, during regular class. Okay, so what is the flipped classroom? I've already explained that a little bit. Basically, you have slides, lecture notes, Michael Porter explaining Porter's five forces on a video, perhaps yourself uh, explaining something on a video, perhaps uh, all of that's available online. Students have to do homework and come prepared to class for the in-depth class discussion. And then class is all about the interaction and going in detail and doing all the things that they wouldn't normally think of uh, in class. So that's kind of what we do with the flipped classroom. And then like Paolo mentioned, I also do the detailed analysis and then bring in a few slides from the deck uh, so that I'm connecting the concepts to what's being uh, done with the case, right? So this is what my Canvas page uh, looks like. So the students before coming to class go to this Canvas page and you can see at the beginning it's clear that we're going to do external analysis week objectives. So there, here is a mini five minute video that I have created but you don't have to do this five minute video. You can dispense with it and then you can see there are standard videos available and I'll give you the links for these videos. The first one is a video on pest analysis done by uh, David Krasinski from Brigham Young University and the second one is the Harvard video uh, done by Michael Porter explaining Porter's five forces and then I also have other readings and you know uh, articles as well, like pa uh, Paolo said, so students can decide if they want to read the article or watch the video. The videos are never more than five minutes, five to eight minutes long, because our uh, folks, instructional designers, have told us never make your video longer than five minutes. Nobody's going to watch it. Uh, so I try to keep it within that time limit. And then you can see after they've watched these videos, they've been given some assignments 
assignments to do. And the first one happens to be uh, on Geico. So that was my live case where I was working with a client and they the students were working on a project and they were gonna like solve questions related to Geico's situation. Okay, so this is what my Canvas page looks like. And so what you can see in general, all my Canvas pages have a similar structure so that the students know exactly where to find everything. Uh, so there's always some videos, some readings um, on the Canvas page. And I usually divide it up into two. So there's always something that is a current event usually taken out of Wall Street Journal. So while you're reading the news and you come across a really cool article, use that article and then ask some questions. And the students, especially undergraduates, love to have something that's connected to the real world because strategy is a core course and we get accounting, finance, all majors in the course and they come in saying, ah, oh, why do I need to study this stuff? I really want to only study my finance stuff. And so I find it really useful to have these real world current video, current articles to help connect the information. Uh, so for example, what you can do right now is how will your industry be impacted by COVID-19? and what should you do based on that impact. Uh, so that would be the quick introduction into the concept and how it's related to current events. And then after that, we do the deep dive into cases. And so those would be the Harvard cases, which I uh, also covered in class. And then throughout the semester, I have this live case running. So like I said, last semester I had Geico. So when we're doing the external analysis portion of the class, the the students are required to do the pest analysis, do the Porter's Five Forces analysis on Geico. So they have to go hunt down the information and I have these detailed tables. They have to fill out the information, do the research. Uh, and then as we go along through the semester, they continue applying all the concepts that they learn in class to the real world project. And then at the end of the semester, the Geico management comes to class and listens to the school students' presentations. All of that can be done 100% online. So last semester, the Geico management showed up on Zoom and the students did their presentations to the Geico management in class. So all of this can be done just as easily uh, online or face to face. But if you're doing all of this interaction, then you want to do lots of breakout rooms like Paolo was suggesting earlier. So example of using something current in class. Uh, so tracktherecovery.org has this uh, data on how different industries have been impacted by COVID. And so your assignment could be, what's your major? What industry do you plan to join? Go to track the recovery, see the impact of COVID on your industry. And if it doesn't happen to be on track the recovery, go find the data on your industry and then come to class, be prepared to discuss the impact of the pandemic and what you might uh, do. And so this would be like, let's say the first uh, 15 minutes of class, let's say. And then after, so this is what the track the recovery um, um, website looks like. And you can see there are some industries here. And if you click on the industry, then it gives you a different graph of the impact of uh, the industry, uh, of, of COVID on the industry. So that could be one real world example that you're using in class. Another real world example, since we use the Disney case, um, you can ask about why Disney was hurt so hard by the pandemic and you can there's lots of videos and you know students would love to go investigate how the theme parks are suffering how the disney cruise lines are suffering because of covid so this allows them to bring in something that they know and also connect it to uh, what's going on in the real world then the stuff that I mentioned before, this is the stuff that I post online beforehand so the students can watch this test video on uh, done by David Krasinski, as I mentioned earlier, the Porter's Five Forces video that explains the concept. And there is also slide decks that are, you know, explanation of what Porter's Five Forces is, what PEST is, what external analysis is, why we teach it, what's the theory behind it, the IO model, all of that is available online. So the 
students can look at it. And just by the way, an absolutely wonderful source of all kinds of information and exercises and videos and snippets are available on this website, Carpenter Strategy Toolbox. It's maintained by Russ Koff from the University of Wisconsin, uh, but it's not just him posting stuff. It's uh, people from all over the world literally uh, post stuff there when they have something exciting. So I would highly recommend that you go check out this uh, Carpenter Strategy Toolbox for most uh, strategy related topics. Okay, student engagement. Online or face-to-face, -face, you must have questions, discussions, let them talk in groups, and then discuss with me. Um, so uh, that's regular in class. Every, you know, five, 10 minutes, I have a breakout session or a discussion so that the students are discussing something. Always, I try to connect it to their lives, uh, their own decisions, their workplace. Uh, so I use uh, Wall Street Journal articles. I do lots of case discussion in class. And more recently, we've decided to also start connecting our research. So we've got lots of star facts faculty doing great research, but they don't always teach in all the programs. So we're taping them and then connecting their research to uh, what's going on with the topic. Uh, so the latest research in the classroom. And then, like I mentioned earlier, Zoom breakout rooms, right? Um, so these are just some questions of things that you can use in the breakout rooms to ask questions. Um, so I won't do uh, much here because I'm running out of time. Overall, the students loved it. I got very positive feedback, even though we switched right in the middle and everything was chaotic for a while, so it went well. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and hand over to Greg Marr, who is going to talk a little bit more about internal analysis. Thank you. Hey everyone, Prithiti, if you can stop sharing your screen so that I can share mine, that'd be great. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, and as Prithiti mentioned, um, I'm gonna be talking about not only internal analysis, but also how to move um, your class asynchronously, okay? So I wanna give you the what, the why, and how for moving your strategy course to asynchronous. But first, so let's start with the what. What does asynchronous mean? So simply, it's learning that happens outside of class time. So what are the elements that are asynchronous learning? So they can include pre-recorded lectures, online discussions, simulations, emails, where there are an announcement, a blast to the whole class, or of course, to one-on-one -on -one with students, podcasts, um, vlogs, and then any kind of social networking sites or online communities. So next, I want you to consider the why of incorporating in asynchronous learning modes in your instruction. And first, I'll start off with instructor preference. So whatever your situation is, there are always constraints on your professional life and your personal life. This is work, work family conflict, yeah? So this was felt most acutely by me in the spring when schools closed for my children, but of course I still had a job to do. So the only time available to me was when my kids were either sleeping or watching television and they watched a lot of television. Um, so moving asynchronously, I felt at the time was the only way that I could do both successfully at the same time. But in addition to instructor preference, there's also student preference. What did my students think? So these are two testimonials from two separate classes, from two separate sections um, from my students. So I'll just read them. So the first student, she said that asynchronous lectures were extremely refreshing unlike many other professors that were demanding attendance at our given section time on Zoom. They're busy too, right? And with another student in a different section in a different course, they said that the asynchronous lectures were very helpful. Having lectures that were pre-recorded allowed me to go at my own pace and pause the lectures to take notes. This is gonna be critical in a moment when I talk about learning outcomes. 
Also, most of the class assignments could be done in order, in any order, so it gave students a lot of freedom and they responded really positively to that. But what are the learning outcomes for asynchronous learning? What does the research say? So one, there doesn't appear to be a difference in mode of learning and learning outcomes. Two, when students are learning content, however, they prefer asynchronous over synchronous instruction. And three, as Paolo pointed out earlier, regardless of what the mode is, what is important as it relates to learning outcomes is the frequency and the quality of the interactions between the instructor and the students and between the students themselves. So now I'm going to talk about how you create an asynchronous learning experience. Okay, so for you, first, you need to start with a wireframe or a skeleton of the learning journey for your students. I'll show you an example of what that looks like directly with internal analysis, um, because that's what I do. Um, but for now, just some broad, simple brushstrokes here. So for your students, make sure that their experience is highly structured. So give them um, detailed but plain instructions really, really spell it out for them. Because in asynchronous, as a learning mode, there is some friction between the students getting access to you as the instructor immediately. And so it's crucial that you give them clear instructions so that they can be successful autonomously. If the contents can be broken up, um, it should be. Um, there's variability as some of, um, so Prathiti talked about how videos have to be five minutes and that's it. And there is some variability um, on how long a piece of content should be. Um, but my advice would be that if you can break it up, if it can be broken up into snackable or small bits, you should do that. Finally, the format should be repeated for each section or content as much as possible. So having this consistent mental model speeds up acceptance and drives efficiencies for everyone. Obviously, there's some flexibility here as Paolo talked about in terms of having some surprise um, there that the students do like that a little bit. Um, but I think broadly speaking, that structure is really useful for everyone. Okay, now let's do a deep dive on internal analysis itself. So how to do this asynchronously through five easy steps. So in step one, in this example, students are asked to review the profit data that you see below of major studios in 2019 via the discussion board. Again, this is learning that is happening outside of class time. Then, on the discussion board, they're asked to consider what is it about Disney that allows them to be successful. So you can see um, the red bars are revenue and the yellow bar is profit. Disney makes the most profit out of all of their major studio studios, or did in 2019. And so what is it that allows them to be successful? Why is Disney different? For step two, the students are provided these pre-recorded videos and the lecture. So in this example, I've provided some links to videos on the resource-based view, the VRIO framework, and understanding what a sustainable competitive advantage are. So these are the core components for internal analysis. And then in connection with the analysis on the discussion boards that they did in step one, they apply all of these concepts to Disney via the Harvard Business School's case on the company that Prathiti alluded to. For step three, teams work together on their own outside of class on two separate deliverables. So this is where they get to apply the concepts that they just learned themselves. So the first part is teams are assigned as investment analysts. So they select a company that they think has a sustainable competitive advantage using the concepts that they just learned through the pre-recorded lectures and the HBS case on Disney. And then this is graded by the instructor. The second part, their submissions are swapped with each other. They review a peer submission from part one of this step and argue why the organization should not be invested in. So they're a short seller in this case. Again, this is, in, this is graded by the instructor. Now, step four is optional. 
and it can be done synchronously or asynchronously with a little bit more coordination. Two standout submissions from the previous step in step three are presented to the rest of the class, so one investment analyst and one short seller. This can be pre-recorded by the students and uploaded to the discussion forum too. Again, all asynchronous. The entire class then gets to weigh in on the merits of the two submissions for further synthesis of the course material. This can be completed via the discussion board and it can be graded as a team project or an individual project. Finally, step five, rinse, wash, repeat. So what I would say is remember, especially when teaching asynchronously, connecting with your students is still critical. Paolo's absolutely right. Make sure your content is representative of the diversity of your students. This can be done by being mindful of the images and examples that we use to connect them. Steven Universe, Mean Girls, Avengers, Scott Pilgrim versus the World, Rick and Morty, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, all make appearances in my classes. Make content that is interesting and exciting to you. Your engagement and excitement is contagious. I wanna thank you for your time and I'm gonna hand it over to Felipe, who's gonna be talking about global strategy. Thank you, Greg. So let me share my slides. I hope you can see them. Uh, so let me start maybe with three messages as a preamble. I think the first one is let me thank kind of Protiti and Esther and Robin for organizing this. So I'm currently the chair of the Global Strategy ID at SMS. Um, the moment we start discussing, let's organize this activity. Everybody can jump in to, to help. So I highly appreciate this. Uh, number two, I learned so much from kind of my fellow panelists. So I'm, I'm definitely, I took a lot of notes, but also I'm definitely going to watch this again when Robin posts this. So I, I think it is really, really helpful what we learned, what I think we could learn from, from the three of them. Uh, and three, you'll see I have a lot of bullet points in my slides. Um, I will make sure that you have access to those slides. So I'll send Robin and she will uh, share them with you. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer questions about any of the points that I'll go probably quickly um, going forward. So let me start uh, also trying to contextualize. Um, so I teach global strategy in the MBA program here at INSEAD. Um, it was supposed to be uh, in May, June this year, so right after confinement and lockdown. So I had to move my three sections, more than 50 students in each section, all online. Um, I also had a number of guest speakers scheduled, and I'll talk more about it uh, for those, for my sections. Um, I was launching two new case studies. So it was a, a very intense exercise. And let me share with you what I ended up doing uh, with the acknowledgement that I'm not a, at all a, an online expert. So I had to kind of learn this as I was doing it. Um, so what did I do in terms of setup? And I think Paulo was saying, no, you don't need to have any kind of professional setup. Um, I think small things made a difference, I believe, from making sure right, that you have good lights to having wired connection. So I don't remember last time I was using wired connection, but uh, it does make a difference if you're showing videos, if you really need a lot of bandwidth. The other thing which was new to me was this idea of connecting with multiple devices. Um, and I end up connecting at least with three devices. One, like we're doing now, kind of my computer with two screens but I also had my laptop where I was annotating. I also connected with my cell phone to manage the chat. So every day I would have at least three devices, one camera, the other one annotation, the other one chat. Um, the, the other thing which happened was um, I use a lot of our online uh, polling. So I ended up using the poll everywhere. Uh, so those of you who are using those uh, surveys, you may know there is a, a free version. Uh, if you need to have more than 40 students, you need to pay. So I end up paying for subscription or poor everywhere, but I, I think it was really well worth it. Um, and the final one, 
which in terms of setup was important for me was really making sure that I talked to a lot of people. So I think somehow what we're doing today is this kind of sharing. Uh, all of us have to back in this online experience. Uh, and I talked to a lot of people within, inside and outside. Um, so like my colleagues who are teaching kind of core strategy, I was teaching, uh, I teach the global strategy course here. And, and I think all the COVID story and the move to online, there were a number of very relevant topical discussions. I think starting with a discussion about the end of globalization and what kind of is pushing, the kind of pushback against globalization. Um, then all this discussion on what drives global integration versus local adaptation um, and a lot of the government drivers playing a, a very important role. And then I think a lot of our discussion, which was kind of very close to what was happening. And I think to I, I really like what kind of uh, both Protit and Greg were saying, you know, bring the, what's happening, bring the world to the classroom. Uh, a lot of our discussions were related to kind of in the global strategy setting, how technology and how companies are adapting to the COVID crisis with more technology, with more global innovation. So I had a number of kind of live cases and I'll, I'll show you some links to them uh, in a second. And the other thing which I did, which was similar to, to Pratiti, um, the final project for my course was, I was asking my students to choose any case we discussed in class and really analyze how the global strategy has been impacted and is likely to be impacted by COVID. Um, how was the, the delivery? And, and I also agree with what Paulo was saying, you know, kind of really keeping engagement was key. Um, for those of you teaching MBAs, and you can imagine the profile of kind of an INSEAD MBA, these are very experienced students. They really want to engage. I have so many McKinsey, McKinsey consultants, former McKinsey consultants in my class. So finding all the different modes that people could contribute was really important. Um, you may have heard about this. There's a tool called Wheel of Names where you can randomly generate names and some, somehow kind of having the cold calling uh, uh, and, and I think this, this was a mix of fun and really making sure that they participate, asking them to have the cameras on. Um, I was also saying kind of having a different device only for the chat was really important. Um, I did a lot of the poll everywhere. And also one thing which is a good thing about uh, us being working from home is the ability to reach out to speakers, right? And even organize what we're doing today and right, and we have more than 80 people in the audience today, which is not common in a typical SMS or any conference session, is you end up kind of getting kind of participation from people who have very busy agendas. Uh, so what I was asking, a lot of the speakers, instead of asking for a full-blown presentation, was said, can I have 30 minutes of your time to participate uh, in my class? So I have done a lot of that from with speakers from all over the world. Um, what were the, the results? Um, I think the, the first part, which I'm sure my colleagues uh, and you have been teaching Eva knowledge, when you're doing that number of hours uh, with synchronous online teaching, it is simply exhausting. So I, I really remember kind of, kind of those weeks have been really, really intense because I don't know, in addition to all the content preparation, that is all the setup preparation, right? You always have to connect at least half an hour in advance. You have to make sure that all the devices are working, kind of coordination with speakers. So it, it was really intense. And, I, and I, I, I'm emphasizing this just to say, uh, maybe some people feel you know, online must be easier or must be kind of less demanding for faculty. And I don't think so. I think if you really want to replicate or if you really want to have a very engaging experience, it's a lot of work. Um, but I think the good news, um, which were somehow surprising to me, uh, I got some of the best ratings I ever got at INSEAD. So I, I, it's the first time that I'm teaching my elective online. It's a very popular elective here, as you can imagine, kind of the profile of our students, global strategy is key for them. Um, and this course was even nominated for kind of one of the best courses at INSEAD, even in comparison with the ones who were kind of taught face-to-face. Uh, -face. So I, I think to me, my reading of this was just saying, no, it, to a certain extent, it, it is possible to have a very engaging, uh, participative, 
global uh, with speakers, synchronous case discussion inductive type of course um, with the technology that we have now. And I'm sure this technology is going to improve. So I'm running out of time. Um, let me uh, just show this. Um, I have created a number of websites, dedicated websites for the cases that I wrote that I teach. Um, so if you're interested in any of those cases, you get an addition to the case itself. Um, you have a lot of the videos that I'm using with the speakers, the interviews, the participation in class. So I'll share that slide uh, later on. Um, so let me thank you, all of you. Uh, thank my fellow panelists. And as I invite uh, Esther to come again and moderate the discussion, let me invite all of you. Um, and, and this is going to be also a good way of us kind of practicing the online survey to go to this address. And I think Robin put, in, uh, Robin put the, the URL uh, on the chat. So it is basically, you have to go to poleave.com, Philippe Monte 944. You just click on the link that you see on the chat. And when you go there, what you see is, you see this question, which is an open-ended question. Uh, what are your questions to the panelists? Uh, what is interesting in this type of polls with Poll Everywhere is in addition to writing your own questions, you will be able to see other people's questions and you can kind of like or dislike. So Esther will be able to see what are the most popular questions that might interest you. So let me stop here, uh, give you some time to go to this address that you have there and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. And yeah, we just give everyone a minute there to go to Poll Everywhere and to start an um, entering your questions there, please. So um, let's see, let's see what comes in. A lot of interesting uh, ideas, a lot of very practical advice, I think there as well. So thanks so much. So we'll just uh, give it a second. So as, sir, as, as people are doing this, may I ask a question to kind of Greg and Pratit more on the asynchronous type of learning. How do you measure participation? Do you see how people are, if they're watching your videos and? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, Felipe. So there are a bunch of ways to do that. Um, so uh, one, you've already identified yourself, um, which is through Poll EV. So I also use that as a way to understand engagement. So I embed them in my asynchronous lectures. And so I can see how many people have responded to the questions within my asynchronous lectures. So I can see just kind of what that is. And you can imagine that that can be testable too. So if you're trying to drive engagement, you make sure and you communicate to your students, hey, there are a few questions in those pre-recorded lectures and those will count as part of your final grade. That can also drive up engagement as well. But beyond that, there's also an AI software solution called Packback. Okay, and what that is, is a, it's, it's a discussion board, but it has an algorithm driven um, and students ask questions on this discussion forum and it's, they get um, real time feedback um, from the AI about quality of questions that they're asking. Um, and so you can, that connects um, quite well with um, the quality of participation for the classes too. And that is all done automatically. And they actually also have a connect for Canvas. So I'm not too sure what your um, what you use as a software package, but that can port quite nicely into Canvas. So not only is there a way to understand engagement asynchronously, but it can also be done um, automatically um, without you really having a high touch point. Um, so that's my answer. So no, uh, lo looking here, uh, looking here at the questions that are coming in, um, one is the top, well, one of the top ones is why use Poll Everywhere over the Q&A function in Zoom? Why bother? Uh, yeah, so coming back to my initial, uh, I, I prefer to use Zoom functions because I'm teaching synchronously, but Greg has a point about asynchronous learning. So Greg, I think you can complement that. Yeah, so obviously uh, the polling software in Zoom is great if you're in Zoom, right? And this is kind of the thing is that all of the software packages that you use 
whether they're Prezi or PowerPoint um, or Keynote um, or Zoom or whatever they are, Microsoft Teams, all of them have their pluses and minuses. Um, so um, for example, PowerPoint has great int integration with PolyV, so they are integrated with your slides directly. But with Prezi, there isn't that integration. That's unfortunate, but I want the aesthetic of Prezi and I'm willing to deal with that functionality. They just have a hyperlink and they go to a separate window. So PolyV works for asynchronous and really the fatal flaw with Zoom polling is that if you're outside of Zoom, it doesn't really work. Let me add to that, Greg. Uh, I think one of the main reasons I use Poll Everywhere was not for this type of poll, but for a number of others. You can not show the results. And when you're teaching synchronously, you can ask students. And then I was even doing this with the speakers. I say, for example, you ask uh, the students, I ask them, do you think that NL, right, the Italian energy company, do you think this idea of mixing innovation sustainability is a good thing? It's just a marketing purpose. And then I went to the CEO of NL and said, oh, what do you think my students will answer? And before showing the answer. So you can really play with this idea of showing, not showing answers. Uh, and let me kind of also address the question, I think this question here that asks about uh, what does not require an extensive amount of time to grade. I think the other thing which I did with Olev, and I know, Greg, if you did the same, uh, I was generating those reports. And I even shared with the students, say, no, these are the, the reports that I can generate in terms of your participation in class. And I think just showing them what kind of information I was getting with the poll lab, it immediately, they start to participate, say, wow, okay, he has a lot of information about how, I, how I'm participating via the, the service. The, I, would, I would just say broadly, regardless of whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, that if you, um, as an instructor, have participation as a component um, in your deliverables, this is kind of the, the sticking point for a lot of students and that it's subjective and how can you really know what a good, um, and that they, they, uh, there's a preference there. And for us as well to drive um, the quality of those comments with data and information that we can give them that's objective. Um, and so I'd like to echo that, what Felipe said as well. It's super. If I may, uh, let's maybe move to the top question here. Which student activities did not work at all? So any no goals? So one thing that I would like to add to that question. So I teach the We case, which is about the gaming industry. And we talk about console gaming versus smartphone gaming. And in class, what I would do is ask the students to raise their hands who are hardcore gamers and play Xbox and PlayStation and who play smartphone. And then when you get a feel for the room, divide them up into groups and say, you guys are the console gaming side, you guys are the uh, mobile gaming side and now debate as to whether Nintendo would be better off in the console gaming side or in the mobile gaming side and in class that goes really well with the face-to-face -face where the students can see each other but it doesn't go so wonderfully well online so debates you you can do them but they won't be as active and fun and sometimes even aggressive uh, as in the face-to-face. -face. So that's one thing I would caution. Is there anyone else who would like to come in on that, on no goals? Well, I, 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 I had a no goal, not with Zoom, but I think here things said we have also, uh, we have a studio uh, where we can teach um, and each student is a, is a screen. And I think one thing that uh, to me was a good lesson was I went there assuming that everybody would have perfect connection and everybody would have high bandwidth. And that was not the case. So I had half of the class, which was there, good connection, good interaction, half of the class, which I was seeing connecting, disconnecting, connecting, disconnecting. So I think having a sense of, right, the, if you're teaching synchronously, have a sense of the ability of your students to have a high speed connection, I think is a, is a very important one. And if they don't, using things which require a lot of bandwidth might not be a good idea. And if I might second that, um, first, when I started the synchronous Zoom sessions, I thought I would require everybody to have their video cameras on so I could see if they're falling asleep or not paying attention. Uh, but that, because of bandwidth issues, I couldn't. So I would only require them to turn it on if I'm asking them a direct question and they're answering something, then turn on your camera briefly. But the rest of the time, it's okay if your camera is off. Uh, 
but then for the ones who are off most of the time, I make sure to ask them a direct question so that I'm sure that they're still around and still paying attention. Um, if I could just add again to that top question, um, as it specifically relates to asynchronous learning. So the question, Felipe, can you uh, scroll up to the top? Sorry, I, it's just basically what student activities did not work at all. And I would say that there's a precipitous drop in participation from any activity that does not have a grade attached to it. So it's unfortunately quite cynical, um, or or maybe that's the wrong word, but but. Um, there are activities that I have put in that are to extend the learning um, or for you to just kind of understand more fully, um, but there is a precipitous drop if this is not being delivered for grading or if it's not part of their grades. And, and Greg, maybe to follow up on that, because I saw a related question coming in um, around the efficiency of grading. So let's um, think about our time constraint um, academic, perhaps who doesn't have TA assistance. Do you have any tips around creating uh, efficiencies there? Yeah, for anybody? So, yeah, so I mean, we, we have talked a little bit about um, Packback. Um, in which it's AI driven as an algorithm for understanding quality and poll EV as well, um, that you can use that embedded in your lectures or you can just hand that out, right? And that those are questions um, that, that students can answer in their own time, so asynchronously, and that there is that connection um, for me with Canvas and that gets uploaded um, directly and that's all done um, automatically, autonomously. So that that would be my answer, at least for those two main components. We also have um, a couple of questions coming in around breakout groups. I think you all mentioned um, the importance um, of breakout groups to keep student engagements and to keep them up active throughout the session. Um, so do you have any thoughts on, I suppose, the size of those groups? Um, should you keep them constant throughout the session? Should you constantly mix it up? Um, and perhaps also how frequently you dip in and out. So just some very practical um, thoughts. Um, is yeah. there anything that you can share on that, please? So, so for every case discussion that I, that I have, I, I, I ask them to go to the breakout rooms and I have a worksheet that they have to work on. So that, that there are some questions that they have to discuss, questions that were not part of the previous, I mean, I did not assign those questions before. They only sit there on the spot. Uh, usually groups of four to five students. Uh, when I, I'm teaching online, we used to use uh, Adobe Connect, so I had the same group all over, I mean, the same group uh, throughout the term. Zoom, it's much faster and easier to randomize it, so I have random groups that are change each class. There are pros and cons on each side, but I, I prefer to do the fast kind of just random groups. And I think also then it exposes students to different uh, ways of thinking to different alternatives. So, so I like that idea of randomizing each class. But, but so I do have specific assignments that I have to complete in the breakout groups and then we go back and then we discuss the case. So I use the same slides that I use for face-to-face -face that I now use for synchronous online. So in my slides, periodically I have questions or puzzles like why do some industries have higher profitability than others? That was a question I would ask face-to-face -face, and I asked that same question online. And then, you know, they are supposed to go into their groups and discuss. So I do spend five minutes at the beginning of class to assign them to their groups and the students don't like that so if you can have a TA sitting in at the beginning of your class just to assign them to their respective groups that's great so that's the one downside of zoom that you have to take into account that you have to assign students to their specific group if you want to keep them in that specific group yes sir uh, let me just add one point which I think Greg mentioned before is the importance of structure and being very clear so I think if there's one area where structure is so important, I think it's the use of breakout rooms because exactly what's the expectation, what you're gonna do in the breakout rooms, how long do you have, what, when you come back, what you have to say. So when I do this in class, I, I improvise much more. and say, yes, let's go now breakout rooms here. Okay, a quick chat, come back. When you're doing this online, uh, I start having really slides. You know, this is the two questions I have to answer. Five, I don't know, the first three minutes, talk to your groups. The, out of seven minutes right up and then when we come back we come back at 10 30 and you, each group's gonna have two minutes 
So very precise instructions. I think this is very important for all the breakout rooms. Super. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, really practical advice here. Um, there are a couple of more questions, but unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm afraid we, we do run out of time. But uh, thanks so much for everyone for sending in their questions. I think we have covered uh, most of them either directly or indirectly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly for myself, there were a lot of very practical, very hands on tips. So thank you very much to all of our panelists, Pratiti, Greg, uh, Paolo and Felipe for joining us for being so honest and sharing the do's, the don'ts, what worked, what didn't work. Um, great coverage in terms of different modes of delivers, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, MBAs. So hopefully there was something in there for everyone. So thanks a lot for joining us. And I, I will now hand over to Robin, um, who will close the session.